right. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today to discuss the latest developments in Satellite Direct-to-Device, or D2D. For those who might not be too familiar, it has been possible to provide connectivity from space to specialized handsets with bulk antennas for decades, using a portion of radio waves clear to provide what is known as Mobile Satellite Services, or MSS. Um, but now, thanks to technological advances and evolving telecom network standards that are integrating satellites for the first time, it has become possible to connect standard smartphones and other mass market devices from space with a much smaller form factor. MSS operator Global Star has been uh, enabling space-based SLS services since late 2022 on the latest iPhones, thanks to its close relationship with Apple. Other D2D players are seeking to go far beyond SLS. Uh, including texting, voice, and ultimately data services. Iridium Communications, represented on this panel today by Repertory Vice President Kara Lieben Azakar, is an MSS operator and, like Global Star, already has a constellation in place for D2D services and is waiting for new standardized chips to come out to serve this market on the ground. Uh, however, there are multiple ways to approach this emerging industry, and each strategy has its pros and cons. Another way involves using radio waves from a mobile network operator partner, which enables satellites to reach devices that are already in consumer pockets uh, because they're already using uh, frequencies with uh, land-based cell towers. This approach requires new technology in space and companies like Link Global have plans for thousands of satellites to provide ubiquitous connectivity. We're delighted to have Margot Deckard here with us, uh, Link's co-founder and chief operating officer, to discuss this side of the market. We also have George uh, G. At Zoglo, uh, vice president for strategy at OmniSpace, which has MSS spectrum rights and is working on ordering its proposed constellation. And last but not least, Jama uh, Sampera, founder and CEO of Satellite, which is raising money for a constellation for connecting Internet of Things devices that could later reach smartphones. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we only have about 45 minutes today and we will be dedicating time toward the end of this webinar for questions from the audience. If you have any, please add them to the Q&A window on Zoom in advance and we'll get to them a little later. So Margo, let's start the discussion with you. There are unique challenges for all the various D2D strategies out there. One that often comes up for a company like Link that is essentially repurposing terrestrial radio waves for use from space is regulation and navigating new rules that must be put in place to guard against the possibility of interference. The Federal Communications Commission has taken the lead on this and recently issued ground rules for what it calls supplemental coverage from space or SCS. Long ago, the conventional wisdom was that director's smartphone services were impossible, yet now FCC has passed a historic rulemaking to shape this sector. How did we get here? Why did this happen? And what has changed? Thank you so much, uh, Jason, and to the audience for their time. So Link really kicked this party off. So we have been in conversation with the FCC since 2018. We had our first license in 2019. And we've kind of taken a crawl, walk, run approach where we've ended up today is with five commercial satellites operating in space. And over our, our, our history and having this conversation with not only the FCC, but regulators around the world, we've found that regulators have totally embraced the life-saving and life-changing opportunity that using terrestrial spectrum from space enables. Because of course, it's it's that phone that is already in everybody's pocket today. It's not a new chipset that has to be put into handsets and then the handsets have to propagate throughout the market. And so really, you know, we're seeing regulators employ different strategies. So Palau was actually the first country on the planet to deploy this service commercially with Link and their regulator took a very flexible approach to using Spectrum. You know, if the MNO uh, wants to use their spectrum from satellite, they have permission to do that. Here, the FCC is taking a flexible, fast approach, but they really need to protect the incumbent spectrum holders, and they need to make sure they have accountability. And that's where we see the SCS rules. One, it's that you have to have a leasing agreement with a satellite provider. That's the accountability portion. 
And in order to protect uh, spectrum incumbent spectrum holders, you have to have CONUS wide spectrum in order to get a license without a waiver. And that's kind of how we've ended up today. And, um, and it's very exciting to see where the industry and where regulators are at. Yeah, and, and Cara, from the NSS side, how will Iridium address this 3D multidimensional spectrum chess game that is now unfolding uh, for G2D? Yeah, and Iridium has, thank, thank you, Jason. And um, Iridium has taken a different approach than, than LINK um, or other supplemental coverage from space solutions. So uh, just, it's hard on these webinars because you can't see the audience. It's hard to know who's there and what they know. So just take a step back like Margot did, which I think was such a great um, brief introduction to her company. Iridium has been in service for 25 years, providing MSS services, a variety of different, there are handsets. Uh, we operate through a partnership network for IoT devices and different types of um, routers that end users can use. Um, we have 66 low earth orbit satellites. We cover the entire globe, um, non-geostationary. We operate within a small amount of spectrum, nine megahertz, just under nine megahertz. And, um, and so for us, it's really about using the assets that we already have for this new product that we see product potential product line. So we, we took a, we started with a proprietary approach where we had an agreement with Qualcomm and that didn't ultimately make its way into handsets. Um, and we pivoted to a standards-based solution, which we're calling Project Stardust. So Iridium has always taken the position with direct to device that it would operate within the confines of its existing spectrum and its existing license so that it can bring to this potential product line, the same thing that it has brought to all of the others, which is a new, a unique perspective and a, um, a reliable, experienced operator. And that's the same thing we're doing here. So we're working through 3GPP to uh, to get certain, um, and this is where I'm a regulatory attorney, not, not an engineer, but in, in sort of layman speak, um, some certain technical parameters and our waveform into the release 19, and that will get into chipsets uh, for IoT devices. And then it will also have some messaging and SOS capabilities. So it's going to take a couple of years to get to that point. And then once we get to that point, um, we'll have agreements with MNOs, which is a little bit similar to what Margot Mar Margo is describing with respect to the FCC's model. Um, but ours will be different because rather than under the SCS model, the uh, satellite operator roaming on a wireless terrestrial network, um, actually the the wireless terrestrial operator will um, have its customers provision to roam on our network when it's outside the bounds of the terrestrial network for that purpose. So yeah, that's that's how we're navigating it. We're actually sort of, of, of we have not had to amend licenses or change regulation in order to do what we're doing. And we think that is the best way to bring this to market using the, like, like I said, the assets and the experience that we have. Very good, that's very clear, thank you. Uh, George, OmniSpace has been very vocal about concerns that SpaceX's is plans to use T-Mobile um, T-Mobile cellular spectrum in the US could cause interference that would derail its proposed MSS constellation. Are you happy with the outcome at the FCC? Yeah, ab absolutely, uh, uh, Jason. I mean, as as we look at what the FCC is doing here, it's 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 very important. Um, they uh, the FCC is wanting to lead in in this in this market space, which I think it you know everybody agrees is a very important development uh, for technology and for driving uh, economic growth around the world. Um, what what we are encouraged is that the FCC has taken a very balanced approach to to this. Um, the 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 original request here was for the use of the, this terrestrial spectrum on a co primary basis. Uh, and, and the FCC's rules specify uh, the potential use of this spectrum on a secondary basis, which means that if there is any interference to terrestrial or satellite networks, then uh, then the service needs to be needs to immediately cease. Um, uh, Omnispace has been, as you say, very very vocal in this area. We've we've presented hundreds of pages of technical analysis to the FCC. We are convinced that there will be interference into our system uh, in contra uh, contravention of the uh, the ITU regulations for uh, for the international use of MSS spectrum at, at uh, two gigahertz. Um, 
And uh, I mean, uh, for for the FCC to pursue this, I think it's important. I think over time, uh, these regulations will be resolved. The technologies will be resolved, but it needs to be done in such a way where it's not going to cause interference or disruption to to the majority of services that that, that are out there. Yeah, the, the one other thing that I'll I'll, I'll add is uh, so OmniSpace is a is is a founding member of. Uh, the MSSA, the Mobile Satellite Services Association, that is focused on uh, the standards-based rollout of these direct-to-device solutions, um, mm -hmm. uh, along with our uh, other founding uh, partners um, from uh, Viasat, Yasat, Terrastar Solutions, and, and Legado. In, in combination, we represent some 100 megahertz of of uh, MSS spectrum that is actually built into the standards currently uh, and, and represented in REL 17 of, of the 3GPP standards. Um, so so this, is, this is spectrum uh, that does not require any changes to, uh, to, to regulations. It, it is completely licensed. As you look at the FCC's uh, SES preceding rules. It, it's clear that that applies to the use of terrestrial spectrum. It does. It has no implications whatsoever for MSS. That that is uh, that is free and clear to provide these services uh, in 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 countries where where, where licenses exist. Um, so uh, so the MSSA is focused on uh, the ecosystem development of of this technology and making sure that the standards evolve in such a way. That uh, that the solutions become more technically capable, more affordable to everybody around the world, um, and 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 uh, and and drive the economic solutions and the and and the uh, the availability of 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 these uh, of these services. Mm -hmm. And I know other regulators regulators uh, are watching the FCC closely to inform their own rules around the rule uh, around the world. Jama, what is your take on what is happening at the FCC? From your perspective across the Atlantic in Spain, and how is your approach to this market different from the others here? Our approach is uh, it's from another point of view. Okay, we are started as an IoT uh, uh, connectivity provider. This means that the spectrum that we need is uh, very few. The, you have to think that MBIoT, which is the standard that uh, Revis 17 has taken to the to the non-terrestrial network, it requires 200 kilohertz. Okay, this means that with one mega, we have five channels, uh, which is a lot in IoT when we're talking about IoT devices. Then our approach is to have our own spectrum. We have applied an ITU, and now we are doing the landing, uh, landing uh, right in uh, more than 60 countries uh, in parallel. Why now we have already uh, some of our main country objective uh, approved? This means that we will have our own frequency spectrum in order to operate for MBIoT. Why direct to device? Because there is an evolution, okay, that seems to be created with all the chips and manufacturers to include MBIoT protocol inside the mobile phones. We believe that this is the right approach in order to have this text messaging, which is the first step in order to have connectivity everywhere with a direct to device. This is the approach that uh, SatMBIoT is uh, taken everywhere in the world. It, it has been uh, approved and uh, and validated uh, by our technology uh, with the two satellites that have, uh, we have already launched and with the four satellites that we are launching in some weeks with SpaceX. Yeah, and of course, efforts to bring policy and, and law in line with all the innovation in D2D is not something that's just confined to the FCC in the US. Uh, international regulators recently updated global rules governing uh, the use of radio waves. What was done at WRC 23 to help set the D to D market up to realize its full potential? Um, and, and Margot and Cara as the rector experts here, maybe you wanna you wanna jump on this one. Uh, Margot, see so you nodding your head. Yeah. So I think uh, from the beginning, you know, Link really took the approach that we were gonna go country by country, and that we were gonna build uh, a regulatory base and a consumer base, and then that would help inform a global framework. I think what you saw at WRC 23 and, and how they set up what they're going to examine at, at WRC 27 is a real recognition that the unconnected is actually growing, that divide is growing. And so you have to take steps now to address it. 
but there's still a desire to build that stable global framework for this industry to thrive on a long-term basis. So the WRC process is coming along just where I, I, I think we would like it to be as an industry. And I think that we'll be able to inform the final outcome by the real world implementation. What makes sense? What, what is handled by business arrangements rather than regulations? The fact that we can operate on a non-interference, non-protected um, basis, and that this is gonna be really exciting especially to the consumer, you know, we talk about consumer adoption, but you have to remember that Link was born from a mission, right? The mission that you have to be able to connect people who can only afford a $5 feature phone or a $14 smartphone, and that those people really can't afford to wait to engage the global economy in the time scale it's going to take uh, to put a chipset in, into our handsets. And I think WRC recognizes that and, and it's been, they've heard what the world community is, is said and they're going to uh, take it up more fully at WRC 27. And I don't have much to add um, on that point. Iridium still developing its WRC 27 um, agenda strategy. So I can't really speak to that at this time, but one point that I don't know that I made well in my first um, piece that Margot touched on that is important to note is that um, Link is going country by country, um, and, and there's other notes of country by country regulatory changes. For our radium solution, we don't, we don't need that, and we don't need necessarily need changes at WRC in order to do what we're doing with Project Stardust. It's really all about 3GPP and enabling that technology and future handsets. So from a regulatory perspective, from an advocacy perspective, we just haven't been involved in those conversations. It's really um, mostly about tracking what's happening. But again, we're still working on our 27 agenda um, strategy. And another significant dividing line for this emerging market that separates um, uh, what we're seeing here, you know, that we have those building satellites from scratch versus companies able to leverage existing orbital assets like, like Iridium, uh, I think through a, you know, a software update that's, that's ongoing at the moment. Um, George, what is Omnispace planning to bring to the table with its own MSS constellation? Yeah, so, so thanks thanks for that question, Jason. So, so we, uh, we, we have been working with uh, satellite manufacturers for, for some time now to develop the architecture for the system that we are planning to, uh, to, to procure later on uh, this, this year into, in, into next year. Um, it, we, we've uh, it's it's public. We've we've worked with some very large primes on developing that architecture, and we're currently going through uh, uh, drilling down into uh, into the specific um, space and, and ground assets to, uh, to 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 provide this this system. Um, as you look at the, um, the 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 most important part of this direct to device solution accessing a a, a cell phone it, it, it is the most disadvantaged device so as you look at providing cell phone communications and we're focused on providing unlimited texting voice um uh, a reasonable amount of data into the device to enable email simple web browsing all of your apps will work um in order to get to that kind of capability into again this most disadvantaged device the cell phone um you you, uh, you also uh, are able to to achieve a very high capability for iot services um and for iot it it spans a very large number of uh, of use cases connected vehicle is 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 by far the single largest um use case um, it represents more than half of the IoT market opportunity in, in, in our analysis, but it also spans many, many other applications from, um, from remote environmental, environmental monitoring. Agriculture is a very, very large number of simple devices that require a very small amount of, amount of data. Um, uh, 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 utilities are uh, uh, utilizing this service for, uh, for, for metering. Um, and oil and gas, and you know, a very very broad range of uh, of applications. So so as this system rolls out, servicing all all parts of the the, the, the market, um, it will be capable of, of of serving all of those needs. Great, and Omnispace I think has plans for six hundred 
Are you finding it challenging to finance this in the in the current economic climate, or what's what's the plan there to, to fund these plans? We're seeing a lot of interest from from potential investors. Part of the the driver of this is it is it is again a, a standards based solution. So to the degree that um, handsets uh, enter the market that 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 are uh, that are five um, G handsets that that are representing um, real 17 and, and and higher releases those devices um, will be able to be brought onto the network simply by by the mobile network operator changing the roaming table and allowing allowing that device to roll on, uh, to, to roam onto a onto a satellite network so as uh, I've been working in the satellite industry for more than more than uh, three decades now uh, part of the issue of, of satellite communications has always been the device. Who's going to install it? Who's going to maintain it? Um, uh, where, where are you going to put it that's, that, that, that's unobstructed? Here, the device is something that's, that, that's sitting in everybody's pocket. Um, certainly, as you look at a, a 5G standard, it, it is something that, that's, uh, that's going to require a, a new phone. Um, as these systems roll out and 5G becomes uh, becomes the, the 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 standard technology for these devices, that will become less of an issue. Um, as you look at existing legacy handsets, we are also looking at solutions that will allow those allow those devices to work. It's it, it's actually not that complex, but what it will provide is a service that's not as capable as a as a standards based 5G service with all of the applications that go along with that. Okay. And another interesting development we saw recently, and George, you touched on this earlier, was the creation of the Mobile Satellite Service Association, or MSA, which is a, a non-profit group of MSS operators that are banded together to help foster collaboration for their approach and harmonize MSS for integrating with standardized devices. OmniSpace is part of that group, but not Iridium. Um, Cara, why, why is that? Is your strategy here vastly different from, from the rest? Um, yeah, Iridium has joined that, that group. Uh, we've talked to them. Um, there is a difference between how Iridium operates and how the members of that group operate as well. Uh, we are NGSO and most of those are, are geo satellite constellations. Um, so there's just differences between the two groups and, and we haven't come to a decision to, to join or not join. And we're still in conversations is the best way I can put it. Thank you. And Margo, do you think it could make sense for something similar from D to D players seeking terrestrial partnerships around the world? Could you ever be a partner for SpaceX or AST Space Mobile in, in some way? Well, first of all, Link's approach and the whole idea of being able to use terrestrial bands from space was really that there be no friction, no need for an industry association. We partner with mobile network operators. We plug into their network as a roaming provider. It's actually a seamless experience for their users. So there may not be a need for an industry association for sat to phone using terrestrial spectrum. Now we'll play together in different spaces in different countries where we're, both of us are deployed, but that's something that we can handle those coordination efforts between companies and between our MNO partners. All right, then perhaps, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, I liked, I liked Margot's answer better than mine. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> So more broadly, perhaps then, does, does everyone here see a future where different strategies for this market coexists? Or is there anyone who doesn't? Oh, absolutely. Uh, sure, but... there will be different strategies, okay, coexisting uh, from the incumbent operators uh, that they have right now, the satellites, that they will try uh, or they will succeed on uh, moving to standards. But at the end, the standard market is so huge compared to the uh, to the proprietary market that today uh, they are operating in. I think that uh, this would be a general move uh, toward working with the standards. We have seen it in the, in the IoT devices. Uh, today, there are around 4 million devices connected to, the, to all the satellite operators. Uh, we are becoming commercial by the end of this year. And before uh, being commercial, we have already succeeded to signing 7 million devices to be connected. Uh, this means that, uh, and this is just a small part of the whole market that is out there, then uh, I really believe that the 
the standard will change everything. Uh, the the RP of course will change completely. Okay, we are not talking about uh, fifteen or uh, twenty euros RP. We are talking about uh, uh, two, three, four euros uh, per device, which means that you need a super efficient approach to the market, uh, and that's the the way we have uh, always seen. Uh, that uh, we have to we have to go there okay that we invented the storm forward that now will be on the release uh, 18 and 19 and we patent it uh, our satellites uh, this means that we can start working with very few satellites for these non-time sensitive applications from day one and increasing the number of satellites and increasing the number of use cases that they are covered with our infrastructure yeah, Mark, I think you're about to agree that there is room for everyone here. Yes, I think, you know, it's the, the world's appetite for communications, shared communications, resilient communications when natural disaster strikes. It's only growing. So there's going to be more than one player in a market. For example, uh, both SpaceX and Link have partnered with Rogers in Canada. There's going to be uh, countries like New Zealand where every operator you know, has a satellite partner. There's going to be like the OmniSpace solution. There may even still be the traditional, you know, like Car represents where you have to have a specialized device, specialized subscription. And as they wade into the um, market with their project Stardust, there, there's gonna be multiple players. It's, it's well over a 300 billion total addressable market per year. And when you see companies like a SpaceX jump in with both feet, those kind of fast followers, you, you realize the market potential is huge. And you realize that in our case, where we have to partner with mobile network operators, we don't have spectrum, they have the spectrum and the customers, you know, that they don't allow for monopolies. They like to have choice, just like they did with the operating system. They, they are gonna want choice in their satellite providers. So it's gonna be a healthy market. There's gonna be a healthy choice for MNOs and a healthy choice of consumers. And at the end of the day, it's all about quality of service for that consumer, right? We see it similarly. I think it comes back to your question about MSSA and Margot's response to it, which I thought was absolutely fantastic. There are different approaches in the market and, and we see ourselves differently right now than what MSSA is putting forward at this time. And so it's not something that we would be currently, you know, we're considering, but not currently joining. Um, and it and it's the same thing with all the different approaches to a direct to device solution. Project Stardust is going to be in off the shelf products at some point um, in the next couple of years, about two years out, um, and then it will be up to MNOs uh, that we partner with for those roaming agreements if they're turned on. We, like Margot mentioned, we think our history of reliable service is and our global um, approach to it, not a regional approach, makes our product. The best, the best one to, that will come to the market in the future, but there will be these multiple approaches that either look like the FCC's supplemental coverage from space um, type solution or an MSS type solution, and there might be more out there that we're not aware of at this time as as well. And that's that's innovation, which um, which we think is good for the consumer, good for the market, and good for all of our businesses. So, so one one thing I'd like to add, if if, if I may. Um, I, I think we, we all see this as a very large market opportunity, and 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 there's certainly plenty of uh, plenty of space here for 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 different approaches to the market. Um, but one thing that I just want to want to throw out there is not 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 all spectrum is created equally. Um, as, as you look at um, areas that are that are far away from um, from uh, sea use of spectrum in 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 the oceans in very remote areas, that that's very clearly clearly an opportunity to reuse terrestrial spectrum. Um, from from our our market analysis, some forty five to seventy percent of the market opportunity, and and that varies depending on the country and the and and the use case, is actually urban adjacent. So as you, we've all seen this situation as you're driving away from a city uh, and you lose cell phone connectivity, to, to have a service that seamlessly connects into a non-terrestrial network is, is, is what this needs to be. Um, to, uh, to operate in frequencies that require exclusion zones uh, for, uh, to, to, to maintain the integrity and, and, and uh, avoid interference into those terrestrial networks means that you're not going to be able to serve those those users that are that are urban adjacent. Um, 
uh, I've spoken with a, a, a lot of mobile network operators. They, they, they've all voiced uh, concerns uh, about potential interference. They've all uh, uh, been sort of posed with this question about whether it's possible to, to move uh, spectrum away from the edges of their networks to reallocate to, to, to satellite. And, and, and I haven't heard anybody uh, in, in, in favor of that. So as as these things roll out through the FCC through the ITU, we, we're going to see we're going to see how how these uh, th these market opportunities play out. But what is what is absolutely clear is for internationally licensed MSS spectrum, um, those those issues don't exist. Thank you, George. Jason, and, yeah, so go ahead, Jason. If I just I might kind of weigh in on what George said. So you know, Link has been testing this technology since you know twenty twenty. And we have done thousands of tests around the globe over some of the largest, most populated cities, Washington, DC, London, very heavily populated cities in Asia PAC. And we have been able to handle uh, doing these tests without any interference to the terrestrial networks. It, you can handle deployments um, of spectrum in order to address co-channel interference, address deployment, whether it's overlapped or or the spectrum is separated um, ge geospatially. So, you know, people continue to raise this concern, but I think the FCC would not have been able to jump in to SCS if they had not had that body of data that Link provided that we have been able to conduct these tests from space using terrestrial frequencies without impacting terrestrial networks. But, but but also to be clear, the, the request was for a co-primary allocation and what was given was a secondary allocation, which must be turned off if there is an interference. So it's it, it's not it's not clear that, that 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 situation doesn't exist. Absolutely, George. And that's what we advocated for at Link because we have partnered with MNOs. So it's their, you know, spectrum and customer base, which makes our system work. So we agree that it's a, it's on a secondary allocation. What, what, what one quick thing that I'll just just add it's 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 one thing for for, for me to suggest that there's that, that, that there's exclusion zones it's it's another thing for, for for SpaceX to recognize it as you look at their submissions to the FCC in the use of the the, the PCSG block they they show a one to two hundred kilometer exclusion zones around the um uh, around the northern and southern borders of the US because uh, T-Mobile does not have rights to use that that spectrum in 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 Canada or Mexico. Um, so, so there, there, there's clearly a, 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 an issue that exists there. I, I will agree with George that not all spectrum is equal. So Link uses sub one gigahertz, and that's because we find it propagates very well and that we can handle these coordination issues. Thank you for that. And we're going to check for audience questions very soon, but does anyone else have any views on the, how the market potential is perhaps different for MSS versus the terrestrial radio wave route you want to weigh into this i'm steering clear okay uh jeff how are we looking for questions thanks jason we've got uh plenty of questions coming in um i'll start off with a combination of a couple of questions coming in um based on everyone's favorite mega constellation starlink and the question for the panel is you know, how do you see SpaceX Starlink as a competitor in this market? How does your solution have a competitive edge based on price or quality or other attributes? So I think, yeah, at SpaceX are talking about enabling tech services sometime this year with, with revenue permission and then voice and, and data not yet coming pretty soon after that. So who would like to take that one? Cara? Sure. I'll, I'll give my, my two cents. Um, so they, they still need, so the FCC's rules created a framework. They still need to get grants of the license to actually bring that to market. I'll say that part. And then um, uh, we, you know, it's going to take us longer. I already mentioned about two years to get the chipsets and in, in devices um, to go through the 3GPB process. Um, I think that the difference is really the global nature of Project Stardust of Iridium service, the spectrum that George already mentioned. We have L band spectrum, which is weather resilient. It is also global, works over oceans, um, and we don't have to go sort of country by country wherever you have that off the shelf IoT device mm -hmm. or the off the shelf handset that has the 
um, the standards-based chip in it, you would be able to use the Iridium direct-to-device solution. So that's where it differs is the, the boundaries and then the, the type of spectrum being used. My point of view with Kara, okay, it will be so, yeah, I think that it will be more difficult than it seems to have a, an MNO uh, allocating a spectrum to these uh, uh, third-party uh, non-terrestrial networks, uh, country by country, okay, to use the MSS spectrum directly, okay, is the way to have a, a something a, absolutely uh, regular in all the different countries and you could use it uh, globally uh, with uh, fully standard devices. Yeah, the, the only thing that I would, uh, I'd like to add is um, a, as you look at um, SpaceX's use of T-Mobile spectrum in the US, that, that, that's clearly um, the, the, the first cab off the rank for, for, for this type of service. Um, and it is it is five plus five megahertz. Um, and and again, we've we've raised our concerns about the nineteen ninety to nineteen ninety five portion of that spectrum being inside the 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 international ITU allocation for um for 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 the S band. Um, as as you look at that service, firstly, that's not enough capacity, uh, and and that is the, the the single national license that exists. All the other licenses are, are regionally based and 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 are going to be subject to to coordination with, um, with, with with different different owners. Uh, and then as you get to, to 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 border issues, it becomes even more complex with the use of of this terrestrial uh, spectrum. So so uh, SpaceX is obviously an extremely capable, a very forward leaning company. We, we need to, uh, to 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 watch what they're doing very carefully, uh, and and this is uh, this is uh, I I actually um, I, I like SpaceX. I've, I've launched a lot of uh, a lot of satellites on 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 Falcon Nine. The Starlink service is 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 obviously incredible. Um, as you look at this service, it, it, it they are certainly setting the benchmark for for pace. Uh, in terms of how quickly we need to roll out this service, and and, and I think that they exist there as a uh, as a um, a forward leading company that we all need to 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 watch very closely. Any more, Jeff? Yeah, another question comes up of the issue of the business case for direct device. How do satellite operators see themselves making money from direct to device? Who pays and how much? I, I can start out on that if 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 you'd like. Um, so so we've done a lot of work on 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 the market sizing here. The um, uh, we were able to close the business case quite quite easily based uh, essentially on on terrestrial ARPU pricing in the markets that we're that we're looking to serve. Um, so what that means is that for a for a user who moves out of out of terrestrial coverage. Um, we're actually able to close the business case on on what they would be paying for for terrestrial connectivity, except um, from from a, a, a non-terrestrial connected uh, lo location. Um, so uh, as you as you talk with M and O's, it's it's not just um, uh, the uh, the the revenue upside. There is also a a, a cost saving element here. As you look at the cost of those edge networks, in 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 some cases they're they're, they're not um, uh, very economic. Um, in some cases, governments are actually subsidizing the rollout of of terrestrial uh, terrestrial networks in order to expand the the percentage of population served. So so there are there, there are different uh, economic elements in play here. Certainly, a subscriber paying for the service, but also the use of um, universal service obligation funds and, and, and other mechanisms in order to to, to expand the the, the, the current of, 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 of mobile networks. Margot, yeah. um, Link has already started early commercial services in a, in a handful of island countries. What can you say about the revenues there and, and how that wraps up as you add more satellites and capability? What's the, what's the rough roadmap? So one of the things that when you do um, sat to phone and you use terrestrial spectrum that you do for your MNO partners, you allow them to monetize spectrum they could not otherwise afford to monetize. They either can't afford the CapEx and OpEx on building a terrestrial tower, the population just isn't there to build that tower. Um, and you also provide them network resiliency. 
And, and George was spot on, but I will also add our MO partners are very concerned about churn, about losing uh, subscribers to another provider that really has ubiquitous, affordable coverage. And it kind of depends on the geography uh, for the MNO. You know, if you have what we call like the concierge user, you know, they may not see an uptick in their price plan for their MNO. If you're the MNO who is now providing service in a part of Central African Republic or Liberia where you didn't offer service before, you're going to offer that, you know, plan as if people for the first time could get connectivity in the place where they live and work. And so uh, we're very excited about what this means for MNO partner. And yes, over time, you know, areas is, is it's a lot of fun. Some of our initial markets, these people have coverage for the first time in their lives. And so they're getting used to using the phones. They're using the service more and more. And it's really very exciting to connect them to the outside world uh, using a mobile phone. Does anyone else have anything to, to add on the, this, this question about where is the money coming from before we take the next question? Sure, yeah, I can oh. just, oh, go ahead, George. No better. I'll jump in, go ahead. Okay, I'll just, okay. Uh, mine's pretty quick. I'm not, I'm not a business person, but what I'll say from Iridium's perspective, we see this as um, a, a, a product and a portfolio of our products rather than the product for our business. So that just changes the way we think about it from a finance perspective. Um, we see it as a consumer can buy certain types of, a consumer end user or um, can buy certain types of Iridium services from a variety of different partners already. And this is just another product that's going to be sort of already in their hand. Um, so it's it's just a different way of thinking of it. Jama? What, what we are doing is drumming with the mobile operators. So then when we talk about uh, having seamless connectivity, seamless includes uh, price. Then we believe, okay, that the, the incremental price of being connected in places where there is no connectivity, which is just part of the time and uh, it's a small part of the market. It have to be absolutely in uh, in, uh, in line with, uh, with the prices inside the city. Then we are talking about ARPUs super low uh, in, in line with uh, some countries, okay? In India, uh, the RPU of the mobile phone is less than two euros a month. Then I do not see any possibility there to selling uh, some uh, some uh, some of these uh, services for more than one euro, okay? The, we we are talking a very, a very, very low output. Then you have to be very efficient on all the deployments. And, uh, and I think that one key point here is uh, what kind of services are you going to deploy? Okay, it's of, of course everybody wants full broadband or wideband connectivity everywhere, but are we able to provide it with a uh, real uh, satellite constellation? Leo, as uh, Kara has uh, explained, okay, it's, uh, it means a lot of satellites that uh, a lot of time they cover places where there is nobody. Uh, 60, 70 percent of the time they are overseas, okay, where there are very few people. And you have to finance it when uh, when you fly it over these places where there is people that need connectivity and have nothing else. Uh, then uh, we see it uh, as uh, fully integrated with mobile operators. We are not invoicing final customers. We are invoicing these uh, drumming agreements with them and those which are our partners, which already know the market and which have the capability of doing uh, customer service, invoicing, and all these process at a very, very low price. Thank you. I don't know if we said, but ARPU stands for average revenue per user. Um, George, do you have anything to add? Yeah, just just very quickly, and and, and to Joam's and, uh, and and Margot's point, one one of my favorite examples there was a, there was a study published by GSMA on Argentina uh, and and the coverage of of the mobile networks in in, in Argentina, uh, and what GSMA have, have have proved is that in order to get to the last one percent of population, it would it would take more capital investment than everything put into the first ninety nine percent, right? So. Uh, those users are just never ever going to be served, and right right now the coverage is only ninety three percent of population, and and to get to ninety four is 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 a big challenge, uh, for countries that have an objective of serving one hundred percent of their population. This really is the only technology that's ever going to get there. Very good, thank you, Jeff. Anything else out there? 
Yeah, another question. Um, has there been any sense that uh, any lack of clarity regarding access to spectrum or regulations has impacted investments into these constellations? And perhaps do you see that changing now, for example, that the FCC supplementary coverage from space rules are in place? I think that this is one of the challenges, of course, okay, as is technology, as is uh, access to customers. Okay, I do not see is the main one uh, uh, challenge that uh, blocks uh, uh, money going to, into the uh, into this sector. I would just add just that I think any time for an investor, they see um, stability, they see regular regulatory engagement um, that makes them happy, right? And so you have investors that are very forward leaning in the beginning. So when you're in, you know, innovative and a startup, they're willing to write the checks. But I think as the older, more established investors, they, they want to see a framework. And so the FCC taking this step to ensure US leadership, I think is a very positive one. Um, for not only our country and companies who use the FCC like Link does as our regulator, but on a global scale, you'll, you'll see the large regulators um, begin to also put forth frameworks and, and rules. George? Uh, as I mentioned before, we're seeing a lot of interest from, from investors. Uh, th there is a very large market potential here. There's lots of questions around standards, around technology, around regulation, and, and around the market sizing and, and, and the economics. And, and we, we feel that we've retired all of those risks for, for our investors. Um, it, th th there was a time a number of years ago where there was a question about whether you'd ever be able to close the link to a standard smartphone from space. And now you can go to an Apple store and buy an iPhone and, and, and you have a satellite phone, right? So um, we're, we're seeing a, a lot of excitement from, from investors. Uh, and again, it is, it is being driven by that very uh, high potential ramp of services. As the, as the system becomes uh, available on orbit, it, it really is a matter of getting to a roaming agreement with the MNO and having to change the roaming tables for their subscribers in order to be able to add millions of, of users onto this, onto this system. Very good. Uh, Jeff, sounds like we've still got lots of questions. Oh, and I think you'll meet it. Okay, we, yeah, we could probably keep going for, for another uh, 45 minutes here, but oh, wow. uh, try and combine a couple of questions here um, <laughs> regarding uh, relationships between satellite operators and mobile network operators in terms of partnerships and exclusivity and so on. Um, Will direct device satellite companies prioritize exclusivity when working with telco partners, or will telcos be able to work with multiple providers in a market to improve to improve performance or coverage? And a related question to that, talking about um, Rogers working with both uh, SpaceX and Link, um, do you anticipate in the future mobile network operators um, being able to set up systems where you know users can seamlessly? between different satellite operators just to provide the best service possible? Well, I will say that Link absolutely envisions that MNOs will partner with multiple satellite providers, as well as one satellite provider will partner with multiple MNOs in country. In fact, I, I think I may have mentioned that one of the uh, countries that we're in commercial service with um, is New Zealand, and we partnered with two of the MNOs there. A spark in two degrees. So, so that's what the world of possibility is going to be. Um, whether or not a satellite provider does exclusives, um, that's up to the satellite provider. That's not what Link does. And so, uh, you know, we're we're all about uh, getting the service into people's hands as as fast as possible, and envision all sorts of partnership structures, which the FCC recognized in the SCS. Neither do we. In each country, we have more than MNO, okay, that is working with their own customers. Uh, since we use our own spectrum, we don't have any uh, tie to the MNOs in order to have exclusivity with them. Yeah, from from an omnispace perspective, we we work with MNOs that have also signed agreements with 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 other satellite uh, D to D providers. Uh, I I think MNOs should uh, should continue to look out for 
what is the best technology, when it's going to be available, who has the best quality of service, um, who has capability that 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 is uh, that that is uh, uh, accessible in in all parts of their their, their market. Um, we, we've signed mobile network uh, operator agreements with some some twenty MNOs. We don't we, we don't typically advertise them. Uh, I think Air, um, MTN was the was the most recent one, which is obviously a very large and and, and, and capable multi country. Um, uh, operator, um, uh, I, I think um, a, a, with regard to to, to exclusivity, uh, I mean, quite quite frankly, from my perspective, I'd, I'd like this service to be accessible to as many as many users as as, as possible. But having said that, uh, exclusivity may may be necessary in order to be able to access some some markets. There's also a question about how the regulator looks at it. Um, and 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 wanting to constrain access uh, in in rural and remote areas to a single operator, um, there I know there are some regulators that may have issues with that. Thank you. Um, maybe, maybe before we take the next question, it might be helpful just to go through each of you for a uh, best case scenario timeline for when you plan to launch full global. DGD services and what those capabilities look like. Because Margot, Link is currently enabling uh, intermittent texting services, but you plan to go far beyond that. What's what's the, the rough roadmap for, for you? Well, I, this is what I'll say in terms of Link's roadmap. We're going as fast as we possibly can to reach those inflection points to provide service for our customers. So our next inflection point is uh, seamless texting on a global scale, which we will reach next year. And then, as you've mentioned, we're on a roadmap to provide uh, voice and, and broadband services. So Link is very excited um, about where we'll be in the coming months. And as we've already mentioned, we're in commercial service today. And Cara, you mentioned, I think, a few years away from, from your uh, launch. What do those um, services look like? Yeah, so we've uh, we've said a couple years, so 2026, realistically, um, the services, we're, we're focused on it as an IoT service, um, but we're also looking at messaging and SOS, which is something that's available on our devices today, so a similar type of SOS functionality as well, and, and some basic messaging um, sometime in 2026. Very good. And Jama, you're also starting with IoT? Yes, we're starting IoT this year. Uh, this year, we are going to have more than 10 satellites uh, that will be deliver global coverage everywhere in the world, up to five to 10 messages per day, which is a big part of the market, okay? Because IoT, in difference with uh, direct to device, with mobile phones, there are a lot of applications that need few messages per day, which is the one that we are. Uh, attacking right now, the one that we are directing right now. Okay, next year we're going to be around one hour revisit time everywhere in the world, and this is the moment, okay, that uh, we may have the capability of uh, launching other services. Very good. And George? Yeah. So, so, from an omnispace perspective, you, you mentioned um, uh, filings at the FCC where we talked about a 600 satellite uh, constellation. So, that, that is a densified constellation. It is possible to get to global service uh, with, with, with fewer than, than 600 satellites. So, we are looking at a phased implementation. We have a number of satellites on orbit now that we're using to demonstrate capability with, um, with, with MNOs and, and, and with other partners. Uh, and, and we are looking at uh, in, in, in the coming years phasing in that approach. Um, uh, and, and moving very, very quickly to, to full coverage for, again, voice data services, not, not, just, um, not just texting, not just uh, NBIoT. Very okay, good. Okay. Thank you for breaking that down, everyone. Uh, Jeff, I think we've got time for a few more questions. Yeah, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here dealing with the performance provided by um, direct-to-device services. A lot of discussion about uh, relatively low bandwidth services like messaging and voice and so on. Um, is that you know all that that's capable? Is that sufficient for direct-to-device companies? And one person in particular asking, what is the timeline for 4G quality broadband direct-to-device services? Yeah, so from uh, if I could just jump in, uh, so from an omnispace perspective, cl clearly as as you look at outside of coverage services, uh, and, and as I've said uh, before, this is it's texting, it's voice, it, it's it's enough data in order to have your apps work for email, for web browsing, 
um, uh, what, what I've often said is if if you're expecting to to stream Game of Thrones into the middle of the Sahara Desert, then, then you're going to be a little bit disappointed. That that's really not recognised as a as a um, a necessary service for this type of uh, for this type of capability. Um, so um, as you look at um, standards development, and, and, and again, back to the MSSA for, for, for a moment, as we're looking at different channelizations, if we, as we're looking at different capabilities that will be built into chipsets and, and, and devices, um, the, the, there is a way to actually get to more efficient capabilities that's gonna, uh, that's gonna deliver a, a, a more seamless, seamless service. Um, we're, we're already talking about how we can how we can address uh, video conferencing and video streaming uh, on, on our on our future systems uh, and looking for ways to to, to make that um, more accessible to more devices. So link can support voice calls today. We just don't do that in order to maximize the amount of traffic that can pass over our satellite constellation as we are supplying only intermittent coverage. But we've had two MNO partners, two degrees. Um, in New Zealand and Rogers in Canada uh, put online the, the voice calls that we've done with them. So the audience can go and hear for themselves that, that capability um, and how exciting it is for people to be able to do voice calls in very remote areas where they could not before. Jeff? Yeah, we had a couple of questions earlier about Starlink, and now questions come in about another provider in the space, AST Space Mobile. Um, the questions questioner is asking your their panel's thoughts on what they're providing and how your services will match up against them. If I may, yeah. I, I think the key differentiator is that AST is going direct to broadband. They haven't taken a crawl, walk, run approach. Uh, they've built very large satellites and deployed them in low Earth orbit, one to date, and that's the crux of their strategy. I think if you look to the other providers, we've kind of laid out approach that grows over time uh, to those broadband-like services. So you, you're planning similar service to AST, but just over a longer timeline, Margaret? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. You know, um, when we first got started, Link was the first company going around and talking to regulators, and this crawl, walk, run approach made a lot of sense to us and made a lot of sense to them. It's a way to get life-saving technology into the public sphere as fast as possible, and, and that's the approach that we thought made a lot of sense, but AST is going direct to broadband services first. So just just to be clear, so a AST is looking to reuse terrestrial spectrum as well. Uh, I think the Blue Walker three is operating in the seven hundred or nine hundred megahertz band. I think similar to uh, to, to to Link. Um, so so the challenge here is 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 the same challenges that we've been talking about before with regard to SES. How how quickly those the, those uh, the, the, that spectrum is going to be uh, made available um, through through MNOs uh, and and. Uh, Resolving any issues that may exist uh, cross borders and 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 between between operating operator usage. Um, also, the, the 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 technology that's being there is is uh, AST is making their own satellites. They are very very large, very complex satellites. Um, and uh, as as you look at the cost and the schedule of that system, uh, it, at least from my perspective, the costs continue to increase and the schedule continues to 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 extend. Um, on on their uh, their this back offering, um, a number of years ago, they were supposed to have a full global constellation, full service availability at the end of last year, which which obviously doesn't exist. Um, that was supposed to be at 110 commercial satellites. So right now they have zero commercial satellites. They have one test satellite, Blue Walker three, uh, and are planning to deploy another five satellites. That was supposed to be launched in the fourth quarter of last year, and then the first quarter of this year, and then the second quarter of this year, uh, and I think they just announced the um, third quarter of this year is when they're they're looking to deploy those. So the 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 timelines continue to extend there, um, and and in order to get to full full global coverage, you need you know quite a few satellites. So we'll we'll, we'll see we'll see how that that network develops. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Uh, sorry, Jason. I agree with George. I think that it's uh, 
super difficult to, to build up and maintain uh, such a constellation with the services that you have to deploy all around the world. Uh, again, uh, we are, I think that it's a constellation that it fits perfectly on the needs of countries like US, where the, RP, where the, the average uh, rate per user is uh, super high. Okay, but uh, when you have to maintain it global conservation with those kind of uh, incomes, it uh, you become more and more challenging. We believe that uh, that the low uh, uh, low cost uh, services is the one that uh, uh, most of the unconnected people is looking for. And I'll take the how we differ part of the question, which I think maybe I might sound like a broken record. So forgive me if I've said all of these things already, but I think it, it gets to what George said. So Iridium has an existing constellation with a current projected life um, of over 10 more years. We're not launching satellites for this purpose or launching new satellites anytime soon. So that's a difference between us and AST. Um, the other difference are the boundaries, which George also mentioned. So theirs is a regional based approach using terrestrial spectrum and ours is a global, we already have our global L band spectrum that is um, that we hold and have licensed. And so we don't need to to you go through any particular regulatory body or um, or licensing process in order to bring our uh, solution to market. And AST Space Mobile, they're building their satellites in-house and, and have faced some production issues in the past. Link also builds uh, its satellites in-house and you're gonna have to build a great, you know, vast number of them. Uh, what are your production facilities look like now? What are they capable of and what are you planning to ramp to? How many satellites a day are you going to be churning out? Well, you know, Link is a growing company. And just as we're growing the number of satellites that we've deployed, we got to grow the number of satellites that we can manufacture per month. And, and we are going to do that. I think to speak to um, what Jamu said about uh, the cost of services, you know, Link, we build small satellites that are cost effective to build. And if you're building expensive satellites, you really can't deliver affordable coverage to somebody in Africa who makes 60 bucks a month. So that is the difference. We build small satellites that are cost effective to build. It's cost effective to ramp up the manufacturing facilities. And uh, just like we think SpaceX learned um, sat to phone from us, we're going to learn from them on their manufacturing process and employ a lot of that same strategy as we ramp up our own facilities. All right. Sadly, we are out of time. Thank you to everyone for sending all those questions in and for the panel uh, for being so generous uh, with their time and offering us a glimpse into the, the fascinating uh, world ahead for device uh, services. Thank you all.